organic, how does the FDA define organic? How does the USDA define organic? And when you start answering these questions, it starts changing your opinion on whether or not you should buy organic food, Real, realistically. So my response and how I live my life is changing by how I'm defining the things that I live by. The, the word organic, you know, is just one simple term that we use, but really it's a bureau, bureaucratic word that is meant to, to, to gain money and control. So you're wasting your money in buying junk when you buy organics, just a little bit better junk. And so you have to decide what you're spending your money on. And I, if you have to buy it because of dietary needs, I, this is not what I'm preaching about today. But the, the point is you have to define it and then decide, where do my principles lie and what am I going to spend my money on? To me, it's not about, I'll probably still buy as much organic stuff as I can afford to until I can grow my own stuff. You know, so I'm bashing organic in the title, but, but this is where we're at. So, like, what is the long game? For me, it means growing my own food. The important point of all of that is define for yourself what these things are. What does the American dream mean to you? So... That's where I have this four-minute video that a random person asks a bunch of other random people, what does the American dream mean to them? For the sake of not embarrassing ourselves, we're going to use random people's consensus. And after four minutes of listening to them ramble about what they think the American dream is, we're going to pull out some stuff. So... What they basically all concluded is a series of bullet points. Personal success, to be rich, to not have any suffering, to have a house, kids, a dog, white picket fence, to be debt free. Government that helps take us, take care of us. Yeah, sorry, I had a typo in there. It was messing me up. The government to take care of our outside needs, to live here and have freedoms, to keep trying, to work hard, to get what you want, to have a content life, have a roof over our head, food on the table, stability. I hope that if you take scripture and everything you know about it, whether it's a few passages or a bunch, and you weigh it against what I just read, you will agree with my title of my sermon. <clears throat> I really wrestled because this is such a deep conversation. How to bring it to you, how to share it. This is a conversation I've been praying through and, and reading scripture and wrestling with God about for a couple months now. And so, you know, I had to find, I had to find a simple way to present it. So I, I really took that list and I did, drilled it down to three main things. And, you know, that's because all these other churches do three things and it just makes sense. But no, but no, seriously, uh, the three, like, there's three hierarchy things, and everything else is really kind of, to me, subordinate to those. They're, you know, so, so I, try to, I try to pick the, the heavy hitters. But we define the American dream, well, the three qualities that define it is wealth, comfort, and security. I know there might be more, but these are what I pulled out. So if you think of more, that's okay. So, sorry. So, really, I'm just going to confront some of those ideas. So, to confront the idea of wealth, just to be clear, I don't think there's anything sinful about being wealthy. I think it's the attachment to our wealth that is unhealthy and sinful. In Matthew 19... 16 through 30, 
It says, then a young man approached Jesus and bowed before him, saying, wonderful teacher, is there a good work I have to do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus answered, why would you call me wonderful? God alone is wonderful. And why would you ask what good work you need to do? Keep the commandments and you'll enter into the life of God. Which ones, he asked. Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love those around you as you love yourself. But I've obeyed every one of those without fail, the young man replied. What else do I lack? Jesus said to him, if you really want to be perfect, go now and sell everything you own. Give your money to the poor and your treasure to the tra- and your treasure will be transferred into heaven. Then come back and follow me for the rest of your life. When the young man heard these words, he walked away sad, for he had great wealth. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Listen, do you understand how difficult it is for the rich to enter into the heaven's kingdom realm? In fact, it's easier to stuff a heavy rope through the eye of a needle than it is for the wealthy to enter the enter God's kingdom realm. Stunned and bewildered, his, the bewildered his disciples asked, "Then who in the world can possibly be saved?" Looking into their eyes, Jesus replied, "Humanly speaking, no one, because no one can save himself. But what seems impossible to you is never impossible to God." Then Peter blurted out, "Here we are." <laughs> We've given up everything to follow you. What reward will there be for us? Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What about me? Jesus responded, listen to the truth. In the age of restoration of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will have 12 thrones of your own. And you will govern the 12 tribes of Israel. For everyone who is left behind their home and property, leaving family, brothers or sisters, mothers or fathers, or children, for my sake, they will be repaid a hundred times over and will inherit eternal life. But many who push themselves to be first will find themselves last, and those who will be willing to be last will find themselves first. Your wealth can't save you. What you earn here cannot save you. Nothing about being American saves you. America is the wealthiest nation in the world. And yet scripture says that it is easier for a camel or a thick rope. If you look at the Greek, there's some confusion. They both are the same word. So that's why... The Passion translates it as a thick rope because it implies it fits through the eye of a needle. It makes more sense. We're already behind the eight ball. If you look at that scripture saying the wealthy, it's harder. The rich, it's harder. Well, if the rest of the world looks at America and says they're all rich, you may not feel it. You might have bills stacked pile high. But I'm telling you, you go to South America, Afghanistan, parts of Germany, Poland, poor. So, you know, this idea of pursuing wealth and freedom and wealth and all of that is not biblical. Wealth, it can be used. It's not, you know, so bear with with what I'm saying. Wealth. And so, so how does this fit into the American dream? Everything about it says, everything about the idea of wealth says that I can just make money and have what I need. Wealth is, to me, like I said, breaking this down, the starting place, the entry point of the American dream. This is obviously contradictory to the starting place of gaining access to the kingdom. You guys with me? You good? Heavy? Um, 
So, so that's, that's one scripture to refute wealth. There's plenty of others. Plenty. It, and it's not the wealth that's the problem. It's the love of it. And if you, I wish, one good thing about seeing that video is your heart would break when you realize how little they know Jesus. It's, it, it, it's, that's really kind of the point of the video is like, when you hear like, man, I just want to be rich so my kids don't have to worry about anything and we can, you know, and, and so that was kind of why I loved the video because I was like watching like, man, they just don't get it. And I took some responsibility because that nameless face is someone that I pass every day and they don't get it either. So confronting the idea of comfort we cannot obtain comfort by our own achievement. Rich people, some might say you can definitely uh, make enough money to have less worries, but you're never satisfied. Uh, Jesus wants to find, wants us to find our comfort in Him. So in Matthew eleven twenty five and twenty nine, and I spent. Uh, everything I pull from the Passion Translation for this. Then Jesus exclaimed, this is starting with verse 25. Then Jesus ex exclaimed, Father, thank you for you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth. And you have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and think they are wise and unveiled and unveiled and instead unveiled it to little children. Yes, Father, you've chosen this gracious plan to extend your kingdom. You have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. No one fully and intimately knows the Son except the Father, and no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. But the Son is able to unveil the Father to anyone who chooses. You are weary, carrying a heavy, are you weary car carrying a heavy burden? Come to me. I will refresh your life. For I am an oasis. I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. You guys know the scriptures, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As I was kind of processing the scripture, I had to go and actually look at uh, animals. Like, let's just simplify it to what a yoke is and how they get used and and things like that, and then what the the Lord showed me was he led me to unequally yoke. And I know we talk about that in marriage and stuff, but a lot of yoking of animals comes in pairs. And so what I always thought that scripture was saying was like Jesus is the, the driver of me who's under the yoke. And because he's gentle, it's not going to be as hard still some misery in there. But what it's alluding to is that Jesus is under a yoke and wants you to be yoked up alongside him. Which changes the whole thing. It changes the whole thing. So, so, so then unequally yoked means that a oxen of one stature or size or uh, strength is paired up with one who is stronger or bigger. They're not, they're not on the same plane. And what happens in unequally yoked relationships with oxen is they find themselves going in circles. There is no control, and they cannot accomplish the mission that they're, you know, the purpose that they were yoked together in the first place. They will never plow the field. So, 
you know, when Jesus says, come to me and I will refresh your life for I am. Uh, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine, learn my ways, and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble, and easy to please. He's way bigger than we are. He's way more powerful than he's the king of kings. But he knows how hard you're able to pull. He's not going to spin you in circles. You're going to get yoked to a loving good relationship and you're going to get to your destination. So the world's comfort is I'm going to strive. The American dream comfort comes from I'm going to strive, I'm going to make all the money, I'm going to buy the house, I'm going to have the food on the table. It's all work related. That's the capitalistic like mentality. And listen, I'm not against this stuff, but it's perspective. It's what's more, what, where, where does it fall in line with the importance? There's a way that we can define the American dream with biblical standards and principles, and then we're the America we were designed to be. So, so, um, yeah. In, in, in today's day and age, everything's apart from Jesus. We, we compartmentalize Jesus all over the place. The, the United States is a Christian nation, but you can't see Jesus anywhere. Anywhere. We just run in a rat race, and then we, you know, not everybody, don't, don't think I'm putting the shoe on the foot. You know, but the world, America, this is largely what we see. In fact, to the point where churches are crumbling because their whole systems have been shattered because they, you know, and there's people that don't want to wear a mask that, you know, they're looking. We're growing because we are not changing what we're doing for a demonic agenda. Getting off my, my notes, but it's okay. Fired up. <clears throat> I may not look it, but I'm fired up. So, so then the third idea was security. So how do I front the idea of security? Well, I had to ask myself, how do we achieve security in America? When I was a kid, it was, you have a savings account. Then a savings account didn't net any kind of return, so then it turned into a 401k. And then when those weren't good enough, it turned into mutual funds and so on and so forth. And now it's investing into crypto and whatever. You know, I do that, so I'm not bashing. Everything I say, I'm not bashing it. I'm just, come on. So we work hard to earn our money, take care of our family, and make our needs, make sure our needs are met. This also sounds like isolationism. Everything we do in life keeps us compartmentalized to our house. I don't, you know, like, so I got four kids. It's hard. It's hard to get out of my house sometimes. I go to work, come home. Work home keeps me busy. How many people got projects going in their house right now? I mean, ever since COVID happened, it was like every, Lowe's has been sold out of stuff for months because everybody's like, can't leave. Let's go fix our houses. <laughs> and some of us have had help and all of that, but, you know, it, it, it's like this perpetual cycle of go to work. Listen, when I was a kid, my stepdad, he went to work. My dad, too. They go to work, and on the weekend, they were working for mama, and they were doing all the chores and all the stuff, and, and the kids just sit there and, like, man, you know, and, I, and I'm guilty of it. I do stuff, and then I don't bring my kids. But, but what we can do is do those chores and bring our kids alongside of us and slow down a little bit and be willing for them to tear a couple things up, to hit the hammer on the nail, and to do the things. Like, that's something that super convicted me uh, of a YouTube channel that I watch, and this dude's a homesteader, and he literally will take 
hours to do one task that would take him 15 minutes because he's letting his kids do it. Amazing. Talk about patience. I'm still not great at it, but I'm trying. At least I'm made aware that it's a problem because, like, my son wants to partner with me in things I'm doing. I'm like, here, let me show you. Okay, let's, you know, and, and, and I missed an opportunity. That's a nugget. wasn't in my sermon, but you get it anyways. But isolationism. So Acts 2, 42 through 47 says every believer has faithfully, or, I'm sorry, let me start over. Every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold all of their sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Daily, daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's houses to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those who were coming to life. That is the biblical standard for comfort and security and wealth. That one scripture, I put the other ones in there because they fit, but that one scripture just, I was like, that that's all I need. That one scripture, that's in that, you know, and Stacy said last week, we all keep asking for the Acts Church to come back, but are we ready to call sin, sin? Are we ready? And let's, we need to be. And you know, there's something else beyond that that comes out of it. We come here, and you'll see me up here, and I'll whisper to Marcia, and then I'll run over and I'll talk to Stacy. The Lord is confirming everything he's doing. If you don't know that, just be brave enough to go talk to somebody about what you hear God saying, and you'll realize that it's not you, it's God in you telling you what he needs you to hear. And it fires me up. I'm like, oh, my gosh. He, on, on Wednesday night, we uh, practiced hearing from the Lord. And Stacy taught how he likes to speak in visions. And Stacy walked us through a vision. Where was I? Oh, yeah, he was walking us through a vision. And it was nowhere that I would want to be because I'm not a beach guy. But I went to the beach. It helped me. It, it, and listen, I don't generally spend a lot of time listening for myself, which I realized when he was sharing all this, I was like, I should probably do that. That's healthy. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing other things, but I don't make it a practice. It's not that I can't. It's that I just don't make it a practice. But I was convicted. I was like, I should probably, for self-care, do that. So I go to the beach. And he was, he was explaining the different areas of, of the beach. One had a waterfall. There was a fire. There was a water's edge. And there was something else. I, I don't So I, I, appeared, I ran to the water, and I got jerked away. Then I went to the fire, got jer jerked away. W went to the pier, and he's like, mm-mm. And then I was in a clam. Sitting in a clam, me and Jesus facing each other. I was like, well, all right, and uh, and he, uh, he 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 said, "Why are you sitting in here?" <laughs> Last I checked, I try to go to other places, but you got me in here. <laughs> so I was like, "Why am I in here? I don't know. I just some. Yeah, I think you know the answer." So <clears throat> so he said. 
something to the effect of it's time to come out of the shell, which was counterintuitive to me because I'm up here a lot and doing things, and I was like, that's, I'm not comfortable with that. Because I feel like I already did, and you got me doing this stuff, and you're, what do you mean? All right. So then then the exercise was kind of over. Like, actually, it was probably too awkward for me to sit there any longer at this point, to be honest. If I'm being real honest, I just kind of was like, I'm, I'm good. I've seen and heard enough today. Uh, and I opened my eyes, and I waited for the uh, the exercise to end, but I meditated on it. I meditated on the vision. And what God said to me in my spirit was, you have been sand, and the pressure has turned you into a pearl, and it's time to show yourself. It's not about my talking or anything else. It's about the beauty that he sees me as. <clears throat> and it blessed me so much. Well, Marsha was not there on Wednesday, okay? And she takes my notebook randomly because she has this word that she just gets. And the, the point to all of this as I open my book is that we build each other up. We confirm things that the Lord's saying. <clears throat> if you think that my clam dream or vision is hocus pocus and you don't believe in God's word, I'm about to prove to you without a shadow of a doubt if you have the ears to hear and the eyes to see that he is real. I'll find it and then I'll prove it. <laughs> she wrote, and this wasn't necessarily for me, it was in my book. Jesus calls you, me, them, the pearl of great price. He sold everything, not seizing equality with God. Am I reading this right? Equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Just the pearl. How was she to know? The, and, and then Mary Booth showed me that night a drawing of a pearl. and said, I drew this like yesterday or whatever. So, so what did that do? That really firmly implanted in me something that God said. There's nothing the enemy can do to snatch that now. If that had just been me in my quiet place, the enemy absolutely could come and snatch it. That is what the modern church has failed to do. We come here on Wednesday, we come here on Sunday, we get a word, we get taught, we go home, and we stay to ourselves. And the enemy steals everything. He yanks it right back to the point where you're no longer a victor. You believe that you've been defeated, and you're a sinner, and you're broken, and that it, we're not in a war. We are not in a war. Spiritually speaking, we have, we're walking in the aftermath of a won battle. It's important to understand that. The battle's won. The battle's won. But we're still fighting because we're not coming together like the Acts Church did. This was in the midst of Jesus. They didn't let it end where it ended because they saw him alive again. They saw him with their own eyes. In pre-service prayer, <clears throat> I heard a revelation of ruling and reigning is being released today. We're, we're called to extend authority to areas that have already been dominated, not be affected by the liar who's trying to say that we don't have the authority. <clears throat> Way off my notes. Er <clears throat> all right. So before I even showed up today and got all of that, I wrote this this morning as my closing for this sermon. If we think, I'm just going to read it to you, and then I'm going to read one more thing I wrote while I was sitting over there, and I'll close. If we think that everything we've been through to save our country politically, 
then we are missing something. This is not about exposing political corruption and fixing an election system. If you look back at the time of Jesus' ministry and every apostle after him, you would see the, the empires and, and the governing ruling bodies over the, those times were corrupt. Jesus was such a threat to them and the apostles after them that that's where persecution came from because they were threatening the ideas and the values of a corrupt system. And they were gaining numbers daily. And people had favor with the Christians because of the way they were living. We are, okay, let's see where we're at. Okay, so, so even, you know, and, and the Bible talks about this. So even now, the devil's trying to steal truth through deceit. And we need to be aware currently of false prophets and false teachers. We are not going through all of this to fix our country. We are going through this to fix our hearts, to fix the bride of Christ. We, as the ecclesia, the called out ones, have been asleep at the wheel for far too long. In my opinion, the driving factor to what, get, what got us where we are today is the idea of the American dream. Even if you never got up and went to work thinking about it, the American dream has kept us in a box. It has kept our heads down and our eyes shut, working hard, and in a lot of cases, just getting by. It has kept us in bondage. We have been played by the system. It is not a political system, but a demonic one that has been in the works since the Garden of Eden. We are just finally seeing that our churches have been broken. Our schools are broken. Our election system is broken. Our economy is broken. President Trump came in and did wonders for all those things. But where are we now? What this shows me is how fragile all of these things are. So all the people who are just sitting back and praying for Trump's return, stop. It is time to start seeing that this has never been about a guy, Trump, coming to fix it. It's all about us fixing it. Why? Because this is God's plan through Jesus. We were never meant to keep the magnificent power and truth of Christ hidden. Who he is was never meant to be kept in a building only open on Wednesday and Sunday. We shouldn't be concerned with church doors closing forever because we should know that this doesn't start or stop in a building. He showed us how to rule and reign over darkness and then left and sent the Holy Spirit so that we could rule and reign with him over the darkness. We haven't done that. And this is why the darkness is running rampant over the earth. Now more than ever, we can see the demonic on full display. But I believe that this is a time for the bride to be resurrected and stand over its defeated foe. It is about us standing up and setting things straight. Speaking up and doing what we need to do. It is time that we walk in our authority, bind and loose, cast out and call forth. It is time for us to link arms, become, as Acts says, the believers in the upper room were, which says all of them were united in prayer, gripped with one passion, interceding night and day. They ate together, lived together. There was no division among them. <clears throat> There was no division. Sorry. There was no division of home and church. This I, I start writing. That's that's a problem. I didn't write quotes. <clears throat> there was no division of home and church. Home was church. Don't come here to get church. Go be the church. Let unbelievers see how well you love others, and then they will see Jesus.
And I might have touched on this already, but I'm just going to read this. You know what happens here? We confirm what the Lord is saying. We act as parts of the body as we are called, and we help each other where we need to go. A hand can't reach for a cup if it doesn't have the arm, the shoulder, the torso, and so on. Imagine how much healthier we would be if we did this every day. If we did this on, in our homes, we often confirm everything the Lord is saying here as we come together. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in community. <clears throat> That's why we want to do home groups next year. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about it down the road. But it's where, it's where we sharpen each other. You know, we can only get so much here. We, I want to encourage you guys, even before January, whatever, when we start home groups, start finding people to do life with. If you've been isolated and just coming on a Sunday and linking up here, Find people to do life with. Find friends in this building. Talk about God together. Confirm what he's saying or not saying. If a false teacher tells you something wrong, there's going to be enough people with wisdom in here, and you can get it confirmed two and three times. You know, it says test all things. Test what I'm telling you today. My, my heart, my heart, Here's the deal. We can't ask for revival anymore. It's here. We just have to perceive how he's calling us forward into it. Revival never stopped. Man stopped revival. It's always burning. It's just every so often a people come along that partner with it in the way that God's calling it forth in that time. I believe that God is calling forth revival in this time to the Acts Church model while incorporating the fivefold ministry. That's a whole different teaching on itself, but that's where I believe that we're going to experience the true power of God. You don't need to come here on a Sunday to see miracles. You need to see them in your home. And you need to see people coming in who saw you loving somebody well see a miracle in your home. It's easy to replicate in a church building where everybody comes together, but what do you do when you got somebody who needs deliverance on your couch and you don't know how to get it done? You call somebody for help. Well, listen, call somebody for help and let's get them set free. And then learn, and then you go and you execute it. This is where we're at. This is what we have to be doing. Too many times I've sat by and been like, I don't know, that's too big for me. I... You know, I've, I've literally had demons laugh at me in the face. Not very, it's super humbling, super humbling. And then they left unfree. Probably needed to get me some help to deal with it. A demon in a person, I guess I should say. I really get hung up on the whole idea of like words and saying things the right way and all of that. But I just trust that the Holy Spirit is striking your heart with truth as he has mine in this matter. If you guys don't mind, if you agree, look forward to revival or anything else with what I said, will you stand up one more time and we'll just, we'll pray. And <clears throat> there's, there's something else that there, the Lord was saying a lot to me uh, during the service, but uh, what was that? What was the phrase? Hell lost another one. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I started crying. Because I was in hell. I was literally working for hell for years. I was just telling Stacy on the phone the other day. I am such a different person. I am such a different person. And singing that song is a victory chant over the devil, and it reinstigates how free I really am, even though I feel like at times I, str I fail, but that doesn't make me less free. Hell lost another one, I am free, 
I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Hell doesn't have his grip on you. Hell doesn't have his grip on you. He might have your ear right now, but he doesn't have his grip on you. He has finger pointing, name blaming, name shifting, blame shifting, whatever you want to call it. He has accusation. He has lies. He does not have you. He does not have you. So, Father, we just, we praise your mighty name that you've chosen a generation and a people like us. I believe for another wave of reformation, and not just in the church, in the food system, in the education system, in the movie industry, in the economic system, all of it. Reformation now in Jesus' name. Reformation now. Across all spectrums, where things that we've given back over to the world saying it's black and white. We recognize, Lord, that you're calling us back into a black and white age where it's devil and God. Nothing in between. If it's not God, it's of the devil. We need to be able to stand on that. No complacency. No surrender. If you see it, cast it out. If you see it, exercise your authority over it. If you see it, deal with it and move on. Don't get hung up there. Keep moving. Like Stacy said, Jesus is moving forward. Let's catch up. Father, we want to catch up. We want to run with you. We want to be, we want to be in your shadow. We want to be right there. There's something about seeing the front line decimate the enemy as it goes forward. We want to be that front line with you. We don't want to drive through in a supply truck later. We have some ground to take back, God, and we repent. We repent for chugging away, being deceived by the apple of the American dream in some cases. We want to be united in that dream biblically. We want to reclaim. We want a reformation over the American dream. I thought that would get a response. We want a reformation over the American dream. We want it to be your dream for America. We want it to be your dream for America. Help us see your plans, your strategy. Help us be obedient in places that we've been hidden, where the fear of man has gripped us and we haven't spoken. I repent the other day. I was in base, clearing base, and there was a devil on a table of a desk. Somebody had a devil, a, a statue of a devil, and everything in me wanted to pick it up and break it, and I cowered. I didn't even say, what is that? I'm sorry, God. I wish. I'm going to go back on Monday. I'm going to say, what is that? Why do you have that on your desk? Jesus crushed that thing. Watch it fall. Watch it break. And I'm going to believe and expect that thing as I walk out of the room and sometime in the future to break, and he'll see the truth of God all over it. And you could call that coincidence. Let me wrap that prayer up officially. Amen. Jesus' name. <clears throat> you, can, you can, yeah, it's legal. You, you could call that coincidence. I call it the power of God. If we don't speak in confidence for the kingdom, when accidents happen and coincidence happen, everybody says that was just good luck, that's our fault. We need to be going around with confidence saying, my God can deal with that. My God's going to take that idol down. And then when I walk out, I don't care if it's a month, it's breaking in your office. Watch it. I am. I'm going on Monday. PSB. I'm coming. Thank you guys for humoring me, I guess, maybe. Hopefully this blessed you. Um, we love you.